All right, hello and welcome. Just let everybody get logged in here. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining. Uh, New York State of Wine is back. And so welcome to our second series, uh, spotlighting New York's prized grape varieties. And today um, we're gonna look at Riesling. So before we get started, uh, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. Uh, during the webinar, there are two communication methods available to participants. We've got the chat section and a Q&A section. So the chat section, as many of you know, is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Um, and then we also have the Q&A section, which is where we would like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar uh, by the panel. Uh, this session is being recorded um, and the YouTube link to the recording will be shared with all of you attendees following the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our, uh, our hosts today. Um, first, we have Jamie Good. Uh, he's a London-based wine writer, author, and judge, uh, and he contributes regularly to a range of publications around the world. Jamie has a PhD in plant biology and was a book editor for several years before he began publishing wineanorak.com, which is now one of the leading wine websites. Then we have Caroline Firstos, uh, born in Colmar in Alsace wine capital, uh, she is a sommelier with years of managing, uh, years of experience managing wine programs for the most renowned restaurants in Paris. And in 2016, she launched a family business, an innovative platform called Sommelier Particulier, where customers, uh, individuals, and professionals can buy wines and services from sommeliers. So I will go ahead and turn it over to our host to introduce our panel today. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce, first of all, um, Oscar Bink, who is the co-owner of Herman J. Vima, um, which is one of the most important wineries in the Finger Lakes. Um, and he's co-owned this since 2007. He's got an interesting CV. Oscar's originally Swedish. He's an agronomist. He has an MSc in agricultural economics and um, previously, he worked in the wine business with, um, with Diageo and Mert and Hennessy in New York City. So um, welcome, Oscar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, my turn to introduce Nova Kadamatre. Um, she's in the wine business since uh, 15 years. And uh, she became in 2017 the first female winemaker. Um, so uh, she now uh, splits her time between the, the Finger Lakes, where she and her family have their wine, the Thressel 31 uh, that we are going to taste tonight, and um, the, the Napa in California, where she's uh, the director of uh, winemaking for Robert Mondali. And um, third of our panelists, we have Kelby Russell, who has a really interesting CV. So Kelby's background is he was in orchestral management, which is kind of cool. Um, but he switched to um, winemaking. He's a native of the Finger Lakes. And his first gig was with Fox Run on Seneca Lake. And then um, most recently, um, since 2012, actually, so that's nine years now, he's been chief winemaker of Red Neat Cellars, which is another of the leading Finger Lakes wineries. So um, with those introductions um, done, um, I think it's time for us to start talking a little bit about the Finger Lakes. And um, Kelby, I'll we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of Dr. Frank and the emergence of vinifera? Yes, I mean, the Finger Lakes, uh, it surprises people to find out is actually a very old wine region in the context of the U.S. Uh, it was planted, uh, planting started in the 1820s and then through the second half of the 18th century or 19th century in particular, uh, significant plantings, uh, millions of bottles of uh, method sparkling made from native grapes. Uh, but that all ended with prohibition uh, and we, uh, as many things did around here, uh, and we actually owe quite a, quite a debt to Dr. Frank in the 1950s coming in these experimental vinifera plantings. Uh, he had experience from his time uh, growing up in Ukraine and, and researching in the Ukraine, uh, the ability to, to get vinifera to survive in harsh climates. Uh, 
So he established his own uh, winery in the what early 60s, mid 60s, uh, and uh, kind of proved that this was possible in the region uh, with recently in particular leading the way, also Chardonnay, um, which is why you see those two as uh, uh, very consequential plantings to this day. Uh, and I think it's why when we think of the Finger Lakes, that sort of like 60s, 70s uh, uh, vinifera point is why we think of the region as young, uh, because that's really when it kind of started to emerge on the world stage once again for the first time in about 100 years. So see, Katie's um, just loaded up a map showing where we are when we talk about the Finger Lakes. <clears throat> and um, as you can see, it's closer to... Um, Toronto than it is New York, even though it's New York State. Um, so we've got Canada just on the other side of the Niagara Escarpment. But the Finger Lakes there, the dominant feature there, um, which Oscar, could you explain a little bit about why it is that, that, that those lakes that we're looking at are so important for viticulture in the region? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the lakes that you see there, there's, um, you know, you both have the Great Lakes in North, but the lakes that you see there, Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake, that are highlighted. Um, what happened is that these two, these lakes are fascinatingly deep. So for example, Seneca Lake is over 200 meters deep. And because they're so deep, they will have, they will moderate the climate around the surrounding areas. Uh, they, they won't freeze in the winter. The climate here is rather cold. When, and then when we say cold, we are specifically very, very cold in the winter. Uh, it's, since it's inland climate, you have Pretty warm summers, but also very cold winters. And therefore, we have potentially damaging, damaging effects on the vines for the winter, but even obviously for spring, for frost damage. But what happens at these lakes, they then keep temperature more constant in the, in the lake. And therefore, there's an airflow, an air exchange from the lake that moderates the climate and therefore makes the vineyard surrounding the lakes uh, agriculturally viable to grow vinifera and drags out seasons and protects the vines. Um, that's what these lakes are for. And that's uh, really the reason why we can grow vinifera in the area. And it creates this very specific mesoclimate. The other lakes in the north obviously affects the weather patterns and so forth also to make it a little drier in the area. And could you please, uh, one of uh, the, the three winemakers, explain about the difference of terroir that you have in Figure Lakes? Is it uh, homogeneous or, or do you have different types of soils? Well, 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 well yeah, Nova, you start. Okay. Um, it's because of the glaciation of how the lakes were formed, the soil is very diverse all over the area. So, you know, if you think about when those glaciers were receding around uh, 10,000 to 11,000 years ago, though they just kind of dropped everything they had picked up. And so you can have very different um, so topsoil and soil structures around, but the subsoil is all Devonian era shale. And so that is, is pretty consistent throughout, although the, the depth to that uh, bedrock is, is quite different all over the area. And then you also have, of course, whether you're on the east side or the west side of the lake, because that changes the direction of the sun influence. And then also whether you're the northern end of the lake or the southern end of the lake, the southern end of the lake is far more steep slopes, like very almost Mosul-like. And the northern end of the lake is more kind of gentle rolling hills. And I always kind of compare that to the difference between like the slopes in false and the slopes in Mosul. And when you uh, drive through the area here, if you ever come and visit, you will see that pretty clear on certain areas. It's a, it's a mosaic of soils. You will see pine trees, you will see silver birches, you will see grazing cows and then vineyards in between based on, on exactly what Nova is saying, this uh, diversity of soils that we have here. So Kelby, um... Finger Lakes, obviously, there's quite a few different varieties that grow there really quite successfully. You know, it's got a diverse region, but it's become famous for, for one variety, and that's Riesling, which is why we're talking about it now. Kelby, why has Riesling um, become the, the, the star in the Finger Lakes? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is uh, uh, Riesling loves cooler climates. Uh, it, it handles them well. Uh, it can really... Uh, make a virtue of acidity. Uh, 
and in the right hands in the vineyard and in the winery, you can really have uh, a great deal of fun with what that allows for. In the <laughs> uh, especially because with a, a warm growing season, but usually cool falls, we get uh, uh, this vintage accepted. I would note we usually get quite a bit of hang time on the Riesling uh, without excessive sugar accumulation. I think that's uh, something that used to be almost a fault in the Finger Lakes. Uh, it was the thought that we couldn't ripen things to the sorts of alcohol levels that uh, maybe were popular 20 or 30 years ago. And now that's actually become, I mean, one thing is climate change. And the other thing is uh, that's actually a bit of a, to our benefit now that we can make these uh, complex and fully ripened wines at 12 and a half and 13% alcohol. Uh, and I think recently has really, uh, you know, it, it's really sung in those conditions. I will admit, I think some of it is a bit of black magic. Uh, you know, uh, there's a great deal of uh, grapes and you never know what's going to work or not work. Uh, you, you pointed out how close we are to the Ontario region just across the border from us, uh, all of uh, uh, an hour and a half drive. Uh, and the Riesling there and the Riesling here, I'll make no comments on which is better or worse, but fundamentally different despite being so close to each other as regions. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's, some of that is just magic. You, know, you don't quite understand it. And um, is there, and, and is, is there anything about the fact that Riesling is actually one of the vinifera varieties that is able to survive very low temperatures? I and mean, I've seen that, that it can survive winter lows down to minus 25 centigrade, which is a little bit lower than some of the other viniferas. I think some are more sensitive than others. And I guess a lot would depend on, on the, you know, the sort of going into the winter season, I suppose, if you get a nice, long, slow acclimation of the vine to the winter lows, then I suppose it, it can go lower than if it goes quickly to the very low temperatures. Yes, that, that's correct. I mean, the the tapering off into winter is important. The snowfall is important. But at its heart, Riesling is uh, more cold tolerant uh, if, uh, in the winter. Uh, it's why we have, uh, uh, we're not trying them today, but it's curiously why Cabernet Franc is another one that does well in this region. Uh, you know, I think uh, more than anything else, uh, the template that you have to look at a grape in this region on is how cold can it handle in the winter. Uh, ripening actually isn't necessarily our biggest concern all the time. Uh, you know, we can ripen Merlot, but the question is, can you get Merlot to survive the winter? Uh, so that's a, it's a very existential way of looking at it, but it does, it does help you make some decisions in the vineyard. So let's have a little chat about um, stylistic choices when it comes to making Riesling. Um, um, and maybe I'll start with you, Nova. What's sort of what choices do you make? You know, do you because I guess in the region you can you can encounter quite a lot of wineries. They'll have a a, a, a slight off dry Riesling and a dry Riesling in the portfolio. Um, whatever else they do, there's, there's, there seems to be a, a liking for a sort of, you know for both different sorts of styles. Um, what are your choices when it comes to making um, um, wine Nova? Sure. So um, I really try to see what the vintage is giving me and kind of take my winemaking from the cues of the vintage. So um, at our heart, we try to make a fully dry Riesling. Um, and so the 2019 is an excellent example of our classic style. Um, in 2018, we ended up with quite a bit of botrytis, and so that one ended up being a bit sweeter than we had historically made. Um, and so that that wine I found was really well received. And so in 2020, we ended up splitting the, the program into both a dry style and a demi sec style. Um, and then this year was such a you know unique year. Um, I did end up with some fruit that's. Um, really special and I'm doing a native ferment late harvest style. So it's, um, it really just depends on what I get from the vintage. So it, that, you know, we start with saying, okay, we're going to make a dry wine, but I never want to sit on, on dogma. If the vintage gives me something different to work with that I can make a better wine from. And Oscar, what do you, are you tending towards dryness or do you like to play with some residual sugar to provide that sort of balance between the sweetness and the acid? Well, uh, adding to both what Nova and Kelby is saying here, going back to what makes Finger Lakes a uh, Riesling region, um, if you look at um, 
regions that have established themselves as Riesling region is that you can make the spectrum of Riesling. And what Kelby was saying, we usually have a beautiful falls here. And I think our portfolio of wines represent a little bit on what's then positive within the parameters of, of the fall. So we make everything from extra brut, early pick, uh, uh, sparkling Riesling to Trocken Bernauslese style. So you will see us doing almost 14 different, sometimes 15 different Rieslings. We have a lot of acres of Riesling and many different lots. And though what Nova is saying also, it depends a little bit what site gives what. Um, but also back to what Nova is saying, we have to be flexible. We are in on the edge of what's possible to grow. We have very vintage specific wines with uh, challenging vintages, sometimes great vintages, erratic weather. So I think we're all have, we start off with have this perfect uh, idea of what we do, but then we also adjust rather well. So you will see us creating different wines depending on the vintage. However, you will see most of us are trying to showcase um, showcase finger legs with a dry style of Riesling. Like, and not, we might not be the one who hunts for the driest of Riesling at Weimar specifically, but that is what represent the region the most, I would say. Um, again, we, we do not, we're not afraid of the sugars. We go into late harvest, you know, spätles and ausles styles too. We do. So this is titled this session as a Riesling Battle Royal. Um, so we need to put Finger Lakes in context with the rest of the world. You know, does Finger Lakes pass muster? Um, who's making the best Riesling? So Caroline, I think I think I should hand over to you to, to give us a little tour around the world of Riesling. Um, because I, I guess your your position is um, you, you, you're kind of like countering the Finger Lakes. We've got three non-Finger Lakes wines here to taste. Um, so what about a quick tour of the world of Riesling? Which, which do you think are your favorite um, regions? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I, ju I just saw my uh, connect, uh, internet connection was uh, unstable, sorry. Um, uh, I didn't get all your questions, but I think you asked me my favorite uh, Riesling uh, regions. That's right. Huh? Yes, globally. So who sorry, is it? Sorry. Who is it, who is it <laughs> no that problem. the Finger Lakes should so, be worried about? So um, I have to say I was, I'm an Alsatian born. So I'm very proud of uh, my uh, my region, uh, and um, is the king of the, the region. Uh, we also have our neighbors uh, uh, in um, in Germany, uh, where I often uh, go uh, for for tasting, especially in Rheinessen or Mosel. Um, uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, today the 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 most And um, that is why the, the question of the, the terroir and the salt was, was interesting me in Finger Lakes, because <coughs> sorry, in Alsace, we have many different types of, of soils. And as for me, Riesling is really the, the most interesting grape variety to show these differences. We will have uh, this uh, granitic uh, expression or um, uh, this uh, chalky uh, expression or uh, volcanic expression that will show at the, its best with Riesling. Uh, so um, finger legs for me is uh, something quite, uh, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, it, it's not, uh, it's, it's quite far away. So I have uh, um, very uh, low uh, uh, connection to, uh, to, 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 to this. Unfortunately, you know, in France, we are very uh, French uh, wines focused. So 
Uh, I, I love uh, to, to taste uh, Riesling from Europe and I used to work also uh, abroad. So I have some, um, some uh, initiation to uh, Australian Riesling, which I also uh, appreciate a lot. But uh, I have to say Finger Lakes for me, it's, uh, it's a quite a, a, new, a, a new region for me, I, I have to admit. So I'm very excited to, uh, to do this, uh, this, this tasting with all you. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with Riesling, I mean, you, you mentioned it there, that, that, that I think most professionals agree on is that it's a very terroir transparent grape variety because wherever it's planted, it seems to take on and reflect site characteristics in this beautifully mysterious way. Um, and, and, and it does it as well across a variety of sweetness levels. I don't know any grape that manages to do that, you know, from sweet to, yeah. to bone dry, it's, you still have this terroir quality in terms of the fact that the wines taste different, pl planted in different places. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think the other thing is that that it's, people rarely blend Riesling. It's a grape that you very rarely find blended with other grapes, because um, it's quite singular and distinctive. And also it's not a grape that you really ever find people using new oak on. So with that sort of um, obscuring of terroir isn't there. So I suspect that it's because of the winemaking style um, and the fact that it, can develop flavor whilst keeping its acidity you know you can have fully ripe reasoning grapes with a ph of 2.8 or 2.9 um so yeah so those regions i think i'd also mention austria as well i think austria is really interesting for riesling and um in canada i think there's some good stuff happening in niagara as i think oscar mentioned um was it was it kelby i can't remember um close in terms of climate to the Finger Lakes but, and, and in location, but, but with very different expressions. And the Okanagan's also making some quite serious Riesling as well. And then we've got Washington State, which we need, need to mention, because Washington State has championed Riesling, um, especially Chateau Saint-Michel, you know, and they, they've been running these Riesling um, festivals um, quite a bit. So, you know, there is a really interesting spectrum of different Rieslings across the world. And, and of all grape varieties, I think Riesling is the one that perhaps spans the widest um, number of climates. You know, you've got very cool climates like in the Saar and the Moselle, um, and going to the Clare Valley, which is positively warm climate. And the wines are different, but they're all interesting. And I think that's, that's fascinating as well. So yeah. I think we have a question as well from uh, Julia Scavo, and this is something I wanted to, uh, to talk about, about the, the wood uh, aging for Riesling. Is it possible, uh, is this grape vari uh, variety tolerant to, uh, to um, a wood uh, aging? I have um, two examples here in Alsace now. It's uh, very, very new um, on uh, some... Um, um, uh, a, a clay, calcareous, and marl uh, soil, where some uh, wood aging is 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 maybe possible uh, according to the um, the type of barrique that you you, you can choose. But uh, I have tasted. I have to say, it's it's uh, brand new. I have I've tasted some uh, some good examples of uh, riesling, but you really have to to um, to pick up the right uh, the right place and the right wood. Yeah. Um, yeah, Julia says she was talking about the wood of the vine. Oh, so do you mean ah. the, the vine age? <laughs> but it's a good answer anyway. I think it's a really good question, even if it's not the question she asked. I still think that's a good question. Because of course, I guess traditionally making wine, um, you, you know, in Germany would have been in, you know, these fooders or the stocks, you know, the, the yes. thousand litre barrels, yes. um, which, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are moving back to using these larger format neutral oak because you can do interesting things with extended lease contact and and i know that um, um ernie lawson uh, has done some fabulous things with aging recently on its primary lease for three years you know with some of his yeah. gross kabaks that that taste beautiful I and mean, it's almost like the longer elevage um the purer the wines become somehow um but if julia's question was about vine age was it vine age i don't know but um, i didn't see it in the chat I just saw a comment just come up. Is that a matter of very tolerant wood? That was the question. Uh, we, if we're talking about, are we talking about, uh, let me kick in, are we talking about if the wood itself on the vine, the old the age of the wine matters if it's to cold tolerant or not? I think, no? 
Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's yeah. a good question as well. Yeah, but, we can. But, make but in general, questions. the vine, the wood on the Riesling vine is thicker than most other wood. So it, that's why it is cold tolerant. And it's and not what, so much the age of the vine itself, right. but it's the actual, the bark, the lignification of mm -hmm. the canes and the tolerance of the buds that helps protect next year's crop. So what, would you be um, cane pruning Riesling then because of the, 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 the winters? Um, is cane pruning better than, than spur pruning? Yeah, I can jump in here. Oh, I typically see the cane, uh, everybody cane pruning because cordons, you, you tend to see wood splitting in the cordons um, after about three or four years if you're spur pruning. And so um, that becomes really challenging over time. And actually in the Finger Lakes, most people have multiple trunks for that same situation. Um, so what you typically see is you'll see vines with two, sometimes three trunks, and all of those trunks are, are cane pruned. And you and you what you do exactly just filling in and we have you have three trunk three canes and you have one as an insurance cane and if they survive the winter you cut the third one so that's what but if you have spur pruning you would not have you won't set yourself up for that situation and going, this is kind of interesting we, we know, I know we need to get to the wines fairly soon but but I'm really fascinated by this um, idea that because of the proximity of the lake so some sites. Um, you can't really grow vinifera, so you have to grow hybrids. Is that correct? So does that is that keeping in the region, keeping a lot of hybrids present, where in other regions they might have been dis displaced by vinifera? Um, and I know this is not something we're talking about now, but is there is there a renewed interest in trying to make interesting wines from the hybrids because of that? Because you're always going to have them. Um... Yes, and uh, why don't I, can I start? Nova, you might have different, well, yes, but we also, we're a, in relatively term, young region when it comes to vinifera. So we're still very much exploring what site is better to grow on. And we are now here at Weimar, we're changing some ways we plant vineyards and changing from Chardonnay to Riesling, or why did we put Riesling on the most protected site where you should grow Cabernet Franc? So we're in, we're in the middle of changing things around. And I know Nova, you're, you're exploring on some new sites also. Um, so I think we are still <coughs> exploring sites with vinifras, but you're right. If you go a mile and a half, maybe on average away from the lake, Seneca Lake, you no longer have guaranteed survival. So then you have to have hybrids or natives further away from the lake. But as you get closer to the lake, they tend to be taken up by vinifera. Acreage, acreage at the moment. Yep. And I would also like to say that I think that the hybrids offer a really interesting um, environmental benefit because they don't need to be sprayed as often. Generally speaking, it, it depends on the variety, but you know that there is it is possible to grow a, a more sustainably that way. Although Oscar and his team are are doing an amazing job with sustainability with vinifera, so it, it is really site dependent. And yes, to your point. Um, we still have, you know, natives and hybrids growing on sites that vinifera would be fantastic on, and we have vinifera in sites that it shouldn't be on. And so, to Oscar's point, we're still figuring all that out. I mean, Kelby, do you have a thought there? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, it's, I'm even thinking of yesterday. We had our first kind of snow in the air yesterday, uh, and uh, you could see, like, sharp, it almost looked like uh, someone put a piece of paper on, like, a uh, a board and sprayed flour on it. The line was so sharp on um, elevation of where the snow stuck or where it didn't in terms of uh, proximity to the lake. Uh, and that maps on remarkably well to uh, what we see with uh, where the hybrids start to uh, really uh, should be instead of vinifera or where uh, the natives, when you're on the hills in between the lakes. Uh, I'm just, I'll quickly tack on, I see this question about climate change and. Uh, the struggle for hybrids. And I think that's a fascinating thing we're seeing with climate change is that the hybrids are actually, the hybrids and natives are uh, having a harder time with it in some ways than the vinifera, at least in terms of it's warmer in the spring and they're budding out earlier because they were always meant to kind of hit the, hit the races as soon as winter ended. Uh, but uh, is in comparison to vinifera, which is a little bit slower to, to come out. Uh, and then they're getting hit by spring frosts, which isn't something we used to see. Uh, and we've had two wet vintages recently, and the hybrid grapes are the ones that have had the worst disease pressure because 
the rain's falling at the wrong time in the summer and they're splitting from too much rain when they're not uh, ready for it. And so I think this this climate change question can, I mean, that's a that's like a whole series of panels, but it's, yeah. it's fascinating that, you know, we have yeah. these groups that we call native here and they're actually in some ways going to struggle the most with climate change in comparison to the vinifera. Also the vigor of those vines are, there's a lot of leaf area, pick up water and so forth. Why vinifera is a little tighter in that sense. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, for another series, maybe. <laughs> right, so I, I think we should we should um, head to the wines. And I think, Caroline, you're going to lead us off in our, our yes. battle royal. Great. So let's go first to um, Germany. Uh, so, um, in the region of Rheinhessen, uh, this is uh, Riesling 2018 um, uh, from uh, Schätzl. Uh, so, uh, Schätzl. Um, and I have to say, this is uh, for me um, a very um, traditional expression of, uh, of Riesling. Uh, it uh, really shows uh, this um, flinty aromas, I, I think. Uh, it was quite reductive at the beginning when I just uh, opened it and the first time I, I tasted it. But um, then these uh, queens, pear, uh, uh, white fruits uh, aromas are, are coming up. Uh, in this um, balance as well, this is a, a, a very typical um, um, German Riesling balance with uh, 12 uh, points of alcohol and uh, 6 grams of residual sugar. So I think uh, this shows very well the, 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 the balance that we can have with low alcohol, uh, uh, lower than in Alsace, in France, for example. Um, so this is a, a very good example for you to, to taste a, a German Riesling on the uh, QBA um, level. So what I yeah, appreciate, yeah, it's, it's very, um, we, we really have this nice acidity. So the six grams of residual sugar are really uh, taken by this uh, very high acidity. And um, uh, we also have this nice bitterness. So this uh, uh, citrus peel um, impression that we have uh, at, at the end. So uh, which, which goes very well with uh, raw fish uh, with, um, uh, it, this, this citrus uh, goes very well with, with these types of, uh, of food or of uh, uh, Indian curry as well. So um, I think this is very representative and this is a, a type of Riesling that uh, I really enjoy to, uh, to drink uh, uh, for, 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 for meal or just uh, to, to begin um, a dinner. Yeah, it's very dry, isn't it? It's it's yeah. bone dry. It's got high acidity. It's very um, sort of it's kind of kind of delicate, but also it's it's got um, yeah. I, I think it's a really good wine, um, but it's taking riesling to its driest. I think even though it's got six grams of sugar, you just don't taste that because of the acid. I don't know what the pH is, but I think it's pretty low. Um, yes, but... pH must be very, very low because uh, you have this bone dry uh, impression, of course, um, and um, you have this uh, this uh, chalky um, uh, impression as well in in the in the mouth. You really have this um, this impression of of chalk. You see what I mean? Uh, the, the the texture of the wine is is very chalky. Do you know what the soils are from this vineyard? In this specific uh, vineyard, I don't know, but um, this reminds me of, of uh, calcareous and chalk, yeah? really. Yeah. I, I, I'm not line, sure, I, I don't know this, uh, this, uh, this state fair. I've never been there, but uh, Rheinessen is, is quite, um, you can find very many different types of, of soil as well. Uh, so I don't know about this uh, specific wine, but um, I have this, uh, this feeling. Yeah, Katie's just sent through this. It's actually nine grams a litre of acid. So that's really quite high. That's like sparkling wine. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's right. That's right. 
But um, this is something uh, that um, German Riesling uh, um, try to do well because, you know, in Alsace, uh, uh, you never know if you are going to have a, a off dry, dry and uh, uh, sweet or half dry wine. Uh, now we have this scale. I will uh, talk about it a bit later with the wine number three, uh, the Alsatian wine. But I think uh, in, in German, you always have this very high acidity, low alcohol you can have um, between 5 and 10 grams of uh, sugar per liter, but you always have this bone dry impression. Uh, this is how a German Riesling is done and uh, this message is very clear and uh, this is what I like. Um, so uh, the, the also uh, when um, Nova talked about the, the, the difference of vintages uh, in the Finger Lakes. Uh, this can be a, maybe a, a difference between uh, the, the styles that we also have in Alsace. According to the vintage, you will have a different type of expression of, uh, of, the, of the wine. So we will maybe uh, see that later in the, in the, in the tasting. So let's move on to wine number two. Um, Nova, this is your wine, so I think it's only fair that you get to introduce us. Introduce it, tell us a little bit about it, how you made it, mm -hmm. and we can taste it. Sure, so this is the 2019 Trestle 31 Riesling. Um, it's funny you mentioned Ernie Luzen and his, you know, gross Gewex on three years of lees because I met with him back in 2014 and was able to taste through some of those wines before he even released them, and I was just blown away by how interesting and complex the wines were. And for, um, for my styles, uh, I do extended lees aging. So mine stay on lees for between um, eight to 10 months before they're bottled. And then they stay in bottle a year before we release them. So by the time they're our current release and the 2019 is our current release, they're, they've got two years of age on them already. Um, I really want to focus on the texture of the wine, so the weight and on the palate and the finish without seeing the sugar there. So this is bone dry, you know, it's 0.7 grams, you know, so less than a gram there, and it's 7.5 TA, so the acid still is quite fresh. Um, so I, I like to look at how that acid and the weight of the fruit itself uh, without the sugar plays on the palate, and while I don't stir the leaves, I just let them sit there. Um, whereas in my Chardonnay program, I do quite a bit of, of aggressive stirring, if you say that. But the, for this one, it's really just to help the wine protect it from oxidation and also add some complexity. Um, the other thing that I do is it's two hours in the press of skin contact before we start the press cycle. So that, that adds um, some really great textural elements as well. And then the juice will stay on lees for kind of a stabilization technique for four to five days before I do that primary rack. So it's a lot of lees work at different points and with different lees um, to really build out the texture of the palate. Yeah, so that's very interesting because I was gonna ask you how you got the texture. And I'm assuming that you, if you're getting skin contact in the press that you've actually destemmed and crushed before you go to press. Correct. Yeah. Because obviously a lot of people think, oh, high quality white wine making, you'll have to whole bunch press. But, but obviously then you don't get that skin contact, which adds really interesting things. So after you've done the pressing, do you protect the must from oxygen or do you allow it to do a little bit of oxidation? Um, I, I prefer to protect it from oxygen for sure. Um, I, I can't always make that happen, but it depends on the setup we have and the year and everything. But um, a little oxygen doesn't bother me too much, but I don't want a lot at that point because there are so many delicate aromas that can be destroyed by oxygen early in the process with Riesling. And so I really wanna make sure that it's as protected as we can. It's not like a fully reductive environment, but it's definitely not a brown juice style either, so. Yeah. And you say you do juice stabulation. That's really interesting. I just, just for the benefit of everyone who maybe hasn't heard juice stabulation before, that's the idea that you're using the, 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 the juice lees um, and you're keeping everything really cold and you're stirring it up. So you're extracting good things from the juice leaves. Mm -hmm. But presumably the key thing is keeping it cold so it doesn't start fermenting. Exactly. Because then you're, then you're in deep trouble, presumably, because you're, you're fermenting on full leaves. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. And um, I see there's a question in the chat is, uh, is that from the soil, the minerality and the saline aspect? I really believe that the minerality is mostly driven by that time and press because we do see higher potassium being extracted from the skins, which adds a natural buffering in the juice, but it also drives that minerality characteristic. Now the soils are amazing, but I am of the mind that there's not like a one-to-one -one correlation between the soil and the minerality. I think it has a lot to do with the water potential of the soil and the nutrients the vine is taking up. And then also this kind of potassium um, interest in the juice. And, and so it's a combination of things that really creates that, that um, I'll call it minerality. I know that term is not always um, a, a great expression, but I, I like it because I feel like it expresses something. It's like a chalkiness to the wine. Um, it, thank you so much for the comment, comment on the fruity nose. Uh, 2019 um, was, I would, I would call it a very classic year for the Finger Lakes. It wasn't a drought year, but it wasn't a super wet year. Um, and so I, I think it, you really have a lot more fruit expression and very delicate aromas. Um, and it's what it, it's not like the super ripe years like we saw in 2020 or 2016, but it's definitely not a wet year like we saw here in 2021 or 2018. So they, they do show very, very differently depending on the vintage. What I love about this is the fact that it's dry, but it's got high acidity, but it doesn't seem austere because that texture Mm -hmm. is just beautiful it's got this lovely flow across the palette um and it's quite compact in the finish but i think this is a this is a really lovely example of a dry riesling caroline what do you think yes i totally agree with you what uh, really astonished me in this uh, riesling is the volume that uh, it has so uh, nova um, just uh, gave gave us the the keys it's uh, because of the work on the lees uh, and uh, these uh, two hours of skin contact i guess that um, that that this wine has uh, such a volume and, and uh, such a, uh, a brightness and uh, very very dry so this is very um, very rare i mean uh, in in all parts of, uh, of of uh, of the world in europe um, you 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 don't get this uh, this type of uh, of balance very often so uh, it's it, i'm very impressed and uh, bravo <laughs> thank you Right. In the interest of time, we need to move on to the next wine. Um, and Caroline, can you, you can you take us to Alsace, please? Yes, come uh, come to me in Alsace. Welcome, um, Schieferkopf. This is um, um, an estate that was uh, um, created by uh, Michel Chapoutier. You know, uh, this is a very uh, world uh, famous winemaker. Uh, based in uh, Rhone Valley, in Tain Hermitage, and um, you know it's uh, it's not so often that you have uh, big names or investors coming in Alsace because it's a very traditional wine region. So um, it's quite close, and it's only family uh, business since uh, uh, three, four centuries. Uh, you have uh, this um, this uh, very long history, and there is no not so many uh, new. Uh, Commerce in the in the wine world here, so uh, we are we are very pleased to uh, to welcome um, this project of Michel Chapoutier. Uh, so um, Schieferkopf is the name of the the estate. Fels is the name of this uh, plot. It's uh, mostly on um, uh, schist. You you understand schist in uh, in English? Is is it the same word? Yes, it's the same schist. schist. Yeah. Schist? yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was not sure. So um, here um, I had um, uh, on the first nose, it was uh, uh, more on uh, the um, on the green side for me. Uh, 2018 is a very hot vintage, so we can uh, feel that that uh, as well in the in the in the mouth in the um, balance of, of the wine. And um, this is again very different from our neighbor uh, that we had for the wine number one, uh, which was very low in alcohol. Here we have 14 degrees of alcohol, so which is very high, uh, not the same um, uh, balance at all. And uh, we have really this impression of spiciness for me, um, this uh, cinnamon, uh, cinnamon notes. Uh, Gilly flower as well, uh, this fruit, but it's more on the 
um, yellow fruit. Uh, it's not the, the same uh, type of fruit that we have for as the, the, the two previous wines. And it Caroline, does. Does, has he done malolactic fermentation here? Isn't Chapitier like to do malolactic with his Riesling? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. and, I'm and tasting a bit of that sort of like buttery character. Yes, this buttery character. Um, in Alsace, normally, um, uh, it, it really depends on the style uh, you, and the, the vintage, but uh, uh, you have this, um, this buttery character, of course, and also this uh, vintage uh, um, character, uh, 2018, which was quite generous. Uh, you had uh, a lot of, uh, of grapes and uh, a lot of uh, sun, very, very hot as well uh, as a vintage, but um, totally different style. You, you really have to enjoy this wine um, with some food. Uh, it's not uh, a wine that you, you can, you can uh, that, that makes you, um, you don't have this uh, immediate salt saltiness, but you have the saltiness of the mineral, I think. Uh, this, um, this cheese, you have it on the mouth when you pass by your, your, your tongue. Uh, you have it, but uh, it has more power. It's it's really now we reach the 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 big point of of our alcohol concentration. Um, it's all uh, it's a super super concentrated uh, riesling in this style. So uh, of course in Alsace you have different representative uh, styles. So this is a, a schist. It's it's a very small amount of uh, of the 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 the, the soils in Alsace. There are not so many uh, schist in Alsace, but uh, this is a good uh, good example for this vintage. It's, it's well done. Great, um, very different wine. So let's go back to the Finger Lakes and Oscar. Um, can you introduce your, your wine? Yes. So the wine we're drinking is the nineteen um, HJW. Uh, HJW is uh, Herman J. Weimer. So that's our home site. We have different sites. We have. Sites called Magdalena. We have Joseph, but HAW. When it says HAW on a bottle, it's on the on the home site. Um, this this wine is uh, also showcasing um, our um, biodynamically farmed initiatives. Uh, in 2015, we started to uh, we always you know you know being in the organic sphere and and in in the winery. We um, have been doing, uh, not specifically biodynamic, but we don't add any yeast in our vineyards at all, or in the winery, and it's all indigenous yeast and, and um, so forth. So in 2015, we hired a, a French gentleman who started a biodynamically, five acres of biodynamically farmed vineyards, and now we're up to 33 acres of biodynamically farmed vineyards. And, uh, and we make now a specific wine here. This is uh, almost full shale, like very shallow soil. We talked, Nova was mentioning it before. Some places we have deep soils with more vigorous soils, and sometimes we're very close to, to shale. Um, so this is a little leaner fruit coming out of that. It's also a cooler site, not as protected by the lake that some other sites are. So therefore, uh, you will never push the higher ripening levels here of Riesling, um, but um, tend to make a, a, a rather lean lean style of Riesling. Uh, this now in relative terms to the rest of our portfolio, I should say. Um, now this wine, uh, we talked about oak before. Um, we tend to most of it stainless steel and we've done that for many, many years. Should we start flirting with oak or any other vessels? It's after many years of fermenting them in stainless steel. So we see, talk about terroir, see what the actual site is presenting, and then maybe introduce another vessel. Should you see that that might enhance the presentation of the wine? And in this site, we see that the acidity is rather dominant. Um, we also, maybe it's the biodynamic farming, maybe it's the site, but we have introduced some more permeable, uh, permeable vessels such as uh, 500 liters uh, used oak barrels in this. Uh, so there are, but again, very long fermentation. We're looking at nine to 10 months or eight to nine months you know, in fermentation in this way. 
beautiful wine so so many so many dimensions to it and even though it's bone dry it's the fruit the fruit has this sweetness and slightly exotic quality i think it's a, a stunning wine really really impressive great thank um, you yeah you you will see talking about the vintage going it was a cooler vintage but a very beautiful fall so so the summer all october was dry and we could pick whenever we wanted and that's rather important with our styles of wine, capture all the nuances of the grape. And 19, although it wasn't the ripest of vintage that Noah said, we could pick in sections. So if you look at our dry Rieslings, could it contain 40 different pickings of fruit? So we can then blend the wines if you put it that way. So that, that's why you also get a little early picked and a little late picked fruit in here. Caroline, what do you think? Um, I totally uh, again uh, agree with you. I I, I love the um, um, this. Uh, I feel this velvety um, um, impression in mouth. Uh, maybe due to this uh, this aging uh, that um, that you made, uh, Oscar. So uh, yes, congratulations because it's uh, again it's um, it's the same as a Nova's wine. It's. Uh, um, like an, a new lecture of, uh, of Riesling for me uh, with all this volume and texture which are quite different uh, from what I ex experience here in, uh, in Alsace or Germany. Great and yeah. can you introduce the next wine um, Caroline just I'm wary of the yes, time I don't want of to. Course. So we're heading to Australia yeah? So let's go uh, yes we are moving to Australia quite a long uh, a long road um, so uh, this is a 2020 uh, signature series from uh, Robert Oatley. Um, I didn't know this, uh, this wine either, but um, I thought uh, at, at the beginning the, the nose was quite close. Um, this is uh, for me um, a, very, a very classic uh, reasoning as well from, uh, from the, 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 uh, from the, 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 the from this region, uh, Australia, uh, quite um, focused on uh, on fruit, on the flesh of the fruit, um, and um, it's it's really as well um, in the mouth in the mouth bone, bone dry. Uh, you have this uh, um, good uh, um, uh, alcohol. Uh, it, it reached the good uh, alcohol potential, and um, you have really this. Um, nice acidity that goes and lingers the, 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 the tongue at the end. So this is um, really, for me, um, a, a, a very uh, hot climate uh, Riesling. I really imagine to, um, to, to enjoy this Riesling when it's very hot outside. Uh, it's, 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 it's really crystal clear and it brings you a, a freshness of fruit, which is very, um, uh, um, uh, how to say uh, it's uh, uh, right away you have this this impression of, of freshness so uh, it's it's a perfect uh, holiday uh, hot holiday riesling i think yeah so yes yeah, so a great great southern it's in western australia it's not so famous for its riesling it's not like the clare and eden valleys which are the two australian regions people often talk about and henty is the other yeah. fashionable one that's in the but but this is um I think this is really good. I think there's, I, I was actually quite impressed with this. You know, it's, it's not an expensive wine. It retails in the UK at about 14 pounds, but it's got lovely layers of, of crisp, focused, quite delicate fruit, I think. And um, it's noticeably Riesling. It's not got any of that sort of TDN character, you know, the, the, the TDN petroly character that can often happen yeah. when you're in a slightly warmer, sunnier climate. And although this is, cool climate for Australia it's I think it's still you know a little bit warmer than some of the regions we've been looking at so far and um, but I think it's really really nicely judged it's very pure it's really crisp um it's but it's you don't totally have the, the volume the volume that we had before maybe it, it don't have the uh, for me the, the the complexity or the um, yeah. uh the it, it's really uh, enjoyable and uh, i really imagine yeah. to open the bottle uh, uh, very simply and it's it's a very good uh, um, entry level range, I would say, uh, Riesling, but it doesn't have the, the complexity or the volume that we had before for me. Yes, that's that's a good summary. So, on yeah. that note, let's head back to the Finger Lakes for Kelby's Knoll. 
Yes. So you're trying the 2016 vintage of uh, a Riesling uh, from a vineyard site called La Homa and a sub parcel uh, called the Knoll, which is, uh, as the name would imply in English, a small little hill in the middle of the vineyard. Uh, it's about one hectare uh, that is a different soil type than that which is around it. Uh, it is uh, more sand based and sandstone based, uh, which is not the most common uh, and lends itself to opulence uh, in terms of how it usually interpret or how we usually interpret it. Uh, wine making for this, uh, we've been making it on its own or as its own wine since 2013. Uh, we, you want to be cautious that the opulence isn't, uh, it doesn't go unsupported. Uh, so. Uh, this gets three days cold soaking prior to pressing, uh, and we're fortunate, especially in a vintage like 16, which was uh, quite dry and quite hot, to have really clean fruit to, to support that cold soaking. Uh, then pressed off, uh, and uh, a, I mean, I'm trying to think, this was probably a seven-month spontaneous ferment, and then left on the lees until the following September uh, before bottling up. So uh, in a lot of ways, Nova, Oscar, and I are all riffing on a similar theme here, but with very different uh, results based on the terroir and based on sort of personal styles. Uh, this wine obviously has a few years of age on it. Uh, this is the current release, uh, oftentimes with the spontaneous ferments for Red Newt's cellar. Uh, we run quite reductive uh, in terms of the, the expression of the wine as, as a young wine. Uh, so the time in bottle really helps it open up. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, uh, much like Oscar. This is probably uh, one of our most premium Rieslings uh, in terms of uh, in terms of style. Uh, certainly a little bit more of a uh, wine industry or esoteric expression as well compared to our dry. And you um, you crush and have some skin contact in the press as well, don't you? Yeah, we we crush and actually crush it into a tank and let it soak on its skins for three days uh, and then three press. days. Yeah. And you keep it cool, presumably, to stop fermentation starting, yeah? Yes, yeah. Uh, we're, we're fortunate. Uh, it does start getting cold here. So if we, we try and time our pick uh, for, you know, if we're late October, usually we can pick it when it's, uh, you know, six or seven degrees Celsius. Uh, and once you have five or six tons of fruit jammed together at that, that uh, temperature, the thermal mass doesn't really allow for much change in temperature. I mean, we, we can actively chill it, but it, it really doesn't need it. I think this is sensational. It's beautiful. Um, it's, 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 it's again, these, these three finger leg wines have all been really astonishing expressions of Riesling, but all completely different, which I think is fantastic. It's, uh, yeah. it's Caroline, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, it's impressive the, the difference of style. Of course, this is uh, 2016, so um, we have uh, this uh, vision of uh, five years. Um, we have a very nice concentration of the fruit, a, a purity of the fruit, which is which is quite impressive. Uh, but we have uh, very it's something very important for 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 great wines because this is a very it's it's uh, quite uh, in a high category of, of quality for me. But you have this salinity that comes um, uh, at the end of the tasting. Really, the salinity is uh, is taking the, the mouth and um, brings the the natural uh, freshness, the natural acidity. It's uh, it's it's very ripe uh, in terms of uh, fruitiness but uh, this salinity comes and balance the, the whole which makes it uh, as a, which makes that uh, as a great wine yes uh, definitely so do, so, do you have a uh, like Grand Cru um, scale as well in your in your region uh, do you have some plots which are in the, in the identified as uh, 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 upper level. Yeah, uh, only, only we've only defined ourselves. We're still in the wild, wild west out here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, we yeah, no, 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 no regulation like that yet. But we, I think we, you know, we know where the sites are, and I think within the wineries, where you start you separating, and you see vineyard specific wines coming, like now Kelby's here, and 
but definitely okay. tonight i think in the three finger lakes wine we had uh you you you, you gave us to taste uh, some very interesting places and plots it's not uh, of course your generic wines that uh, we had the pleasure to to taste so thank you very much because uh, it was a, a very high uh, level of uh, of uh, of examples of, of Riesling. So um, I, I guess, I think uh, if you have higher level again, uh, I will come to taste that because uh, it's, it's very good. So Battle Royale, um, um, Caroline, who, who won? Did the Finger Lakes win? I think Riesling is a global, uh, <laughs> it's a global experience. <laughs> and uh, we, we saw tonight that the variety of Riesling is, um, is enormous. And uh, it's also very nice to, to get, uh, as you said, uh, a 13 or 14 pound Riesling in, in UK. Uh, and just to have this taste of good Riesling, it's also very interesting to have entry level uh, Riesling, um, to have this uh, identity of soil expression and I'm very, I have to say, I'm very impressed uh, with uh, this uh, Finger Lakes reading. I've never had the occasion to, to taste, uh, to make this, uh, this experience to taste all the, the reading uh, uh, with each other. So uh, congratulations, because um, this, uh, I really want to come and uh, to visit uh, your, your wineries and to, to see what you, you're doing, because it's, it's a very good job. And I, ha I think there is, um, um, a question which is very interesting again uh, um, um, regarding potential aging potential because it's true we here we can taste um, 1920s riesling in, in alsace or riesling that have uh, 40 or 50 years old it, it will not be the case for you but uh, maybe 10 or 10 years old riesling how does it age in your in your region yeah and i think uh, we Nova commented a little bit there. It does age very well. I actually, sit as you see, I sit in our library here. We have wines that are you know 20, 25 years old, and they age rather well. I think, but recently in general, when it's made well balanced, it will age very well, and so does it here in the Finger Lakes. So yeah, we've had them. But again, we're a young region, but we're getting there, and now you can start enjoying wines like Kelby now is showing. You know, I think, I think we, you know, Nova and Kelby. I think we, we go and drink our wine that are four or five years old. That's when they start to sh starting to show off their best. And then they can age better later. So, yeah, very much so. All right. I'm conscious that we've, we've come to the end of our time. Um, and I want to respect everybody who's tuned in. Um, I want to respect their time. Um, so... Um, I think it's time to, to thank everybody who's taken part um, and also to hand back to Katie because Katie may have some things to say. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you uh, to all our winemakers. This was a lot of fun and we hope that all of you attendees uh, enjoyed this new format. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for taking the time out and we hope that you'll join us in the new year on February 8th for Cabernet Franc off. So uh, we'll see you in 2022 and meanwhile, take very good care and happy holidays.